Hello, welcome to Soul Sessions, another live episode. And today we are starting a brand new series. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, what is the series? The series is called uh, the different types of spiritual paths. Um, a lot of people have questions about uh, they're, they're kind of in that spiritual exploration, and um, yoga philosophy actually has four distinct paths that overlap, but we're going to go over all four of them and tell you which, uh, you can decide what path is the right for you and how to apply it. And I, it made so much sense when we talked about it. Uh, today we're talking about karma yoga, and so the title of this uh, soul session is How to Burn Past Karma. How do we burn it up? And so you had said that it made it sounded like we were saying we're going to burn past karma really fast. <laughs> yeah, we'll go right past it. Yes. So we're going to talk about what is karma, what is karma yoga, and how do you practice it in your life. So um, yeah. hang on to your hats. We'll talk about a lot of uh, karma is such a big term used in many different um, spiritual teachings and coaches teach it and there's a lot of confusion of to what it mm -hmm. is and how to not have bad karma and what's good karma and all that so so let's start with rob what is karma yeah, yeah and i'd like to also preface it with the our approach to it okay so we're approaching it from uh the philosophical perspective we're not talking about religion so obviously if karma is part of your religion, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about more of the philosophy, Eastern philosophy, uh, Jungian, uh, the Jungian perspective on karma, how he saw things from a psychologist's point of view. And our approach is essentially we're students of the mind. Mm -hmm. We're curious about how human beings have addressed this question of why do things work out the way they do for me? What mm -hmm. is, is there a destiny or am I free to create my life? Those kind of and questions. And when we say the mind, we're not talking about just the thinking mind, we're talking about consciousness itself. Very much so, yeah. Students so karma, of, where does... of consciousness. Yes, so where does karma come from? Where does the term come from? Yeah, so uh, um, karma entered the Western consciousness, uh, I guess in the... Mid 1800s, people started to think about what were the seers from the East up to uh, when they were meditating mm -hmm. and looking inward and exploring consciousness. Um, and then, since they've uh, developed like this steam engine, and the, the we can actually travel more around the world. A lot of these yogis from India came to the U.S. and started to. Yeah. And the Western, other parts of the Western world. And yeah, and, 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 and especially relevant for our talk uh, on the four yogas, uh, Vivekananda came at the turn of the century to, yes. to America mm -hmm. and traveled. Uh, he was in New York, he was in Chicago, he was in, here in California and established these Vedanta centers that really introduced a lot more people uh, and very important and, and creative people to the idea of karma. So what is karma? So it is, <laughs> yeah, uh, from our perspective again uh, of, of uh, Jungian coaching, it, it is our conditioning. In other words, when we interact as human beings, as conscious human beings, we interact with the environment, the results that we get from our actions feed back to uh, our mind and condition our mind. So very early on, uh, we have these conditioned selves, and then also we inherit conditioning from our genetics, from Absolutely. our ancestors, and from every human being, there's certain adaptability, like the baby suckles a breast, it, no one has to teach it. it, like it's an instinct. So we have a lot of these, this karmic imprints on us as we enter the physical body. Yeah, so one of the translations is action, another mm -hmm. translation is work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, that concept of work and action, meaning taking action in the world, in the, in the, in the apparent reality that we call the material world, the attachments that we have to things, to wanting to get things, our desires that are 
uh, projected into the action that we want to get a certain result that desire right there is what conditions us mm. it, so it, the, it is the, what gives the environment then the power to condition our own mind we give it the environment the power the power doesn't do any the environment doesn't do anything to us except we are our interaction with it we decide how to respond to that environment so do we shut down? Do we hide? Do we fight? Fight, flight, or freeze, basically, right? Mm. And uh, the conditioning is really very simple. The attachment is, are, is moving away from pain to pleasure. So we're always looking for that. And not always, for some people, pleasure is just not in pain, you know, just numb. Uh, and some people it's, you know, avoiding any kind of risk. And so we um, imprinted early in our life, we have these, patterns that we um that we store that is basically our karma from all the the reactions and, and um conditioning of of yeah, that we, experience we can say the the sum total of our past actions is mm -hmm. our karma okay so if you take every action you've ever uh emitted as a human being from the time you were born to right now the con the total the sum total of those actions is your personal karma mm -hmm. now there is no good or bad karma as people mm -hmm. sometimes in the west uh define it well um, the ego defines it as good or bad right? yes uh, let's say in relative terms from the point of view of the ego uh good and bad is defined as to what gets me my goodies <laughs> the things that i'm after or what's unpleasant and what prevents me from getting mm. those things uh, but it total it's totally arbitrary what is good for one person is bad for another person and so there is no external definition of good and bad karma it's simply again the accumulated it's a subjective the, action the sum total of your past actions and then subjectively we decide Oh, that must be, uh, and, and I think if you really look at it from a practical standpoint, how many times in our life have we um, experienced something that we have initially thought was negative, but actually led us into a place of, of where we needed to go? So this idea of the negative and positive mm. is so, and it's subjective in that moment. And then we look back and like, oh, I'm so glad that happened to me because that actually catapulted me. I think about even uh, when I worked in New York and I had a really terrible boss, I'm like, oh, like, what did I do to deserve this woman? And uh, but be, having her not be nurturing, not be kind, helped me um, help me, for, you know, decide, you know, maybe maybe I'm not happy here right. and uh, motivated me to move to Colorado and start a new world. And um, I wish her well. Thank you very much <laughs> for your for your service. Uh, but that, but in the moment, it feels as though. Yeah. Uh, but the karma I felt myself would be how I learned to respond to someone who's mistreating me, and I just didn't say anything. I was very quiet, and so that when we think of karma, it's really how we respond to the environment, and then the environment is basically reflective of that karma. Yes, and so. Uh, speaking of misconceptions, the another important misconception from uh, or in the West is that uh, this misunderstanding that this the ancient seers were not talking about a material universe. Mm. In other words, they were working from a very different paradigm. They did not see the material world as the an absolute reality as we do in the West, mm -hmm. or physics sees it this way. Um, they saw the universe as a conscious manifestation mm -hmm. that everything was this pure awareness, this made of consciousness, made itself. of consciousness. Yes, and therefore it leads us to a very different understanding if we adapt or adopt that perspective, their perspective so that we can understand what they were meaning when they talked about karma. So it, it leads us to a very different uh, way of seeing karma if we are living in a conscious universe. Mm -hmm. Because now we're seeing that the interaction that we're having with objects, people the, and the things. objects of our perception, people, things, situations in the ma manifested universe, they're really they're really us they're really a part of our 
awareness, part of our consciousness. And We're other, connected to it and not, yeah. not this separate. That's it. Yeah. Because in a material universe, those things would be separate. Mm-hmm. We would be in our head be, being aware of things, but those objects would be separate from us. They mm-hmm. would have their independent reality existence. Mm-hmm. And in a conscious universe, that's not the case. The object, just like you, the perceiver, are identical. Mm. You're both ex- existing in the same way, in the same space and time. You know what I love? At one of our retreats, she said this, that the ego is actually an object interacting with the other objects, but our true self is like watching the whole play happen. So when we see karma, we're really seeing the ego's conception of you know the um the the patterns Mm -hmm. but there's a part of us that's not touched by any of those patterns that we're actually free of it always there but we're not uh no just just not aware that we're already free um there was a um there's a a, i've just read this recently uh adi shankara one of vedanta teacher back in the 600 a.d or something (laughs) it was a long time ago and he was talking about this uh this uh, guy who um, was, he was a, um, she, uh, he had cows and the cows would take the uh, dirty laundry out into the sh- uh, to the river to Oh, to I wash. think they were donkeys. Donkeys, that's it, yeah. And so uh, he did that every day, that was his job. And one day he asked his son to take the donkeys to the river and the son went and he was like, they're not tied up, but they won't move. And I don't know why they won't move. And uh, he said, oh, I totally forgot. Every night before I go to sleep, I, I put my hand over their ankles so they feel like they're being tied to the to the to the um, stable. And he said, in the morning, I have to untie them because so they they can go. And so in their mind and in, in the donkey's mind, that conditioning feels like it's trapped, mm. but it's always been free. And that's kind of how we need to approach karma. He was saying that's how karma is. He's like, we're already free. But we're going through the motions of getting ourselves tied up in this conditioning, and we need a guide and a, a teacher to help us free our mind and remember that we are already free. So I think a lot of times, um, I know for me, when I first started doing my spiritual growth, I felt like I had to go work through all this karma and I have to heal it and I have to, you know, um, you know, do me- like these like me- you know can- incantations and cleansing of it and like it's like this like material thing stuck to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love this story because it's it, it, the, the way to get freedom is to realize that we're already free. Yeah. And it, and through that, that's what we're going to talk about is what is karma yoga? How do we how do we free ourselves from the from the um, idea that we're stuck, the idea that we're limited, like those donkeys who had the, the perception that they, I'm tied to this 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 stable, I can't go anywhere. Um, yeah. How do we free ourselves? And that's what karma yoga is. Yeah, and the, the third big misconception uh, is is that karma is some kind of cosmic retribution mm. for our bad deeds. Oh yeah. Uh, which is a very Western uh, idea of kind of the sin being punished. Uh, a ca- a Catholics, we all feel guilty. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> part of the Catholics. Judeo-Christian tradition, mm. but it's a it's a misunderstanding of the the philosophical concept of karma the well, way I, it was developed in the East. Uh, so it it is not cosmic retribution. It is simply that our pure awareness has been uh, kind of diverted and, and forgotten because of our misperception of objects in the world. So we think, again, that, that idea that we're separate from these objects, and in thinking that, mistakenly thinking that, we create uh, this sense of separateness. And suffering, in a way. And right? we create our own suffering, exactly. Mm. But it is mainly due to ignorance of the true nature of our awareness and of reality. So in the East, the whole process was to get back to that original understanding or that true understanding of what is the nature of my awareness and what is the nature of reality. And that's where yoga comes in. So yoga is the getting back to that correcting the misperception, understanding, oh, the objects of 
the, the manifested universe and my awareness are identical. Mm. They're identical. There is no difference. That is the non-dual philosophy. So I know a lot of people would say, I've heard this before, um, that you know they've struggled, especially when I was working with single people, they were mm. thinking, and I thought this too, that I must have done something terrible in a past life for me to have this terrible experience and I'm being punished. And so none of that is really in alignment with the Vedanta teaching, which is that you're not being punished from some force because ultimately then that would assume that good and bad are hard line, you know, that there's mm. actually a, a, something that's really bad or something really good. And, um, and, if, and so people spend a lot of time, like, let me talk about my past lives. And I went to um, a spiritual coach one time when I was in Colorado and I uh, just, I met her at a networking event. She's like, I'll do a session with you. And I paid for a session and she's like, oh, you had a couple past lives where you left some doors open. And I said, oh no, like, what do I do with that? And she said, oh, I closed them. And I'm like, okay. It was just like weird. Like, uh, that we have to worry so much about what happened mm. or if something happened and how do we get there and this kind of feeling of helplessness that I can't control what's what's in my past karma and you know that it, it creates a lot of fear I think with people of how do how do I approach my life right now do I have to go do past life regressions and clear things up and heal the past and if you think about your life right now if you think about who you were at five just in this life We've had many lifetimes just in this life where we're a different person when we were five. We did things that were when we were kids that were silly or when we were in our 20s. God knows I've done things I regret in my 20s and 30s. And and so how do you clean up all that? You know, you, if you think about that, do you want to clean up everything in your past? No, we have to start focusing on what is arising in my mind today? And that's the process, right? That's the 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 idea that we can get so lost in and even uh, when I was a hypnotherapist I used to do regression work a lot I'd regress people and have them reprogram their their memories and so well, you started this I then. started this that's <laughs> my problem I'm sorry uh, and and then after a while after working with people I was like you know what they don't need to know what happened earlier in life or in another life they just need to work with the emotion that's being triggered right now and i realized i just stopped doing regression work because i felt like it was just extra story and extra layers and just feeding the ego and and what we really need to do is work on what's arising now it's such a cleaner way to work and it's less time and effort because you really whatever's ripening they call it the karma yeah. ripening in this moment is really what you need to do yeah yeah, there, there's certainly been a medicalization of spiritual techniques and yeah. processes in, in, in the West. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yoga then, we, the way we define it in our process is discipline. Mm. It's not necessarily, I mean, yeah, the, the translation of the word sometimes is defined as union or yoking. Yeah, you can think of it as the yoking our individual awareness to this universal mind. Uh, the true self, but in in practice, it is the disciplining of our mind, of our, of our own awareness, so that we can lead it back to that original perception that everything is one, everything is consciousness, not the separate appearance of things that we see uh, in our ordinary perception. And so what we want to do to practice karma yoga is to be in the moment and, and to show like, because I feel like I, people spend so much time trying to rehash the past, clean up the past that they're not even living their life. And they spend years just mm. analyzing and analyzing their childhood. And, and, and while that's very informative and good and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think people get stuck there. They get stuck in the past and they think if I can come to, if I could fix what happened to me, or this event that happened to me and, and fix it, then my life will be good. Well, your life can be good right now if you just look at it from a different perspective. And, and that will, it's not about pushing what happened to you away, but it's about un having a higher mm. understanding. Uh, higher understanding of what happened is much more powerful than actually feeding and agreeing that something harmed you or you got harmed and you did harm. Uh, and then you have to clean that up and ask for people for forgiveness. All that stuff is it can be really overwhelming if you think about it every moment of our life we we 
hurt people and they hurt us and it just would be it's like an impossible task for a human being to um try to clean all that up right it's like right. Uh, how are you going to fix all that you said that once to uh, a couple of our clients and i was like yeah like you can get stuck there in regret right because when you start to to apply some of these uh principles that um what what we perceive is essentially an interpretation that we're making about life mm. so it, if all your past experiences are interpretations what is the reality how did it, those events really play out mm -hmm. and there's no way to determine that it's mm. simply your subjective interpretation of what happened mm -hmm. so people in those scenes and those things that you call trauma or your past events your past karma they they will each define and and describe that experience that same experience in a very different way than you did mm -hmm. so which one is real yeah is like your could, interpretation right or is their interpretation the, the correct experience like i could give someone a compliment and have great intention and be kind and for them it might be the worst thing for them because they can't feel here the compliment and they think and then in their mind they make up a story of my intention you yeah. know oh she's trying to win me over or she's you know or or the someone or you say something that it constructive and someone thinks that's criticism and so we have this um our ego is so limited to how it, it's like filters uh the truth and uh so if we're looking at the if from an ego perspective of course it feels that the world is terrible and there's these terrible things and these terrible people and uh, we have to be careful and we have to like, you know, put up our walls and our boundaries and all those things. And uh, when we really start seeing things from the truth of that wholeness, we start to realize that there's nothing to fear. Yeah. We and, and realize how powerful we are. And then we can really be in the world and be with the good and bad, the dark and the light and a dance with it versus be sucked in and feel like I'm going into this, uh, you know, sinking hole that uh, that I can't get out of. Well, uh, and then a I, lot of blaming it, yourself, thinking I must have been a terrible person in a past life to have this experience, and it's my bad karma reaping, and oh, I'm so terrible. How does that help a person? Yeah, uh, where a lot of people resist is this idea that that the, what they believe to be so real and so true in their life is very much illusory mm -hmm. it's more dreamlike than mm -hmm. than we uh, we are led to believe mm -hmm. uh, and so what i would tell them is this it's not that we're saying you can't dis you can't depend on any of that reality or you or you have to deny it or, or or push it away no it happened but it happened as a personal subjective experience now what that means is that there is still a reality there, but the reality is not in the external events, is in it your is perception. in your awareness. That awareness is the reality that is consistent and constant. The the events continuously change. If you notice the way you recall your early experiences are much different today than they were when you were a teenager well if you had like i was thinking too what you were just saying is that if you had an experience as a child that seemed very traumatic like mom left me at the grocery store or parents got divorced in your awareness now if you were having that same experience with the knowledge you have now you would have reacted differently to it but as a five-year-old it might have been like the end of the world so is the event it no it's the it's the perceiver of the event that actually and then you evolve so that event is like um i think one of the things i learned from you rob that was so profound is when we have a, a difficulty with a parent that mistreated us or wasn't there for us you you said that that person doesn't exist anymore and i was like yeah because they've grown too yeah. and a lot of our clients are mothers and they you know regret you know what, how they raise their kids now that they have this knowledge and it's like that person that was the mother you don't doesn't exist anymore that child doesn't exist anymore what exists is the awareness of that of who you were but the that's the awareness is the truth 
And so I love that idea that, you know, these like, I think when you think of it from a material perspective, Mm. it's like you're collecting rocks, like your karma rocks, you know, like the heavy ones and the light ones. And then you're carrying your backpack through your life. And there's these solid things that are real that have hurt you or that you've hurt others and that you have to carry this burden. It's just a perception. and, And that's not really the truth. Yeah, so in in the Gita, which is kind of the the really the most accessible um, a proponent of karma yoga, Krishna is explaining why should I practice this karma yoga? Uh, Arjuna asks, why why should I act the way you're you're instructing me to act? And Krishna simply tells him because it is the way to free your mind Mm. to free your mind from the conditioning power of the environment Mm. in other words karma yoga is designed to uh, allow you to act in the world to take action to do your duty to work and and create but to be free from its conditioning power of you in other words when you take action through karma yoga your actions do not incur any karma they leave no when you're not attachment no imprint on you Mm -hmm. on your psyche on your mind Uh, now how does that mechanism work it's simply that the when we act out of the attachment from the i from the ego that result the result of my action either positive or negative leaves a residue on my psyche like i'm bound to that action now i'm i'm beholden to it because of my false perception that it is i who am taking the action Mm -hmm. the action is really arising from a much deeper well that is called the true self the true self is the one that is acting we're simply kind of going along for the ride. <laughs> We're a passenger. Yes. In this vehicle called the body. But yeah. when we when we are attached to the ego, to, to the eye, and to the objects in the world, and we think those things are going to make me happy, those things are going to give me uh, wealth or love or some kind of comfort, that attachment then is what binds us. So in karma yoga, the practice is to drop the attachment to the results, not to the action. In other words, you can still take all the actions that you need to take, but you drop the attachment to the result of the action, and that liberates you from the karmic imprint. So when we normally take action, we get a negative result, we're imprinted on it, and we say, I'm never going to do that anymore, like put your hand on a hot fire we're conditioned so our karma will not want us to go near fire but what if we need to run in a burn, burning building to to save someone that that will limit us right that our karma past karma would yeah. say don't do that um and so what i love too is a lot of people think that non-attachment means that you don't care and that there's no no use to have goals because if you're not attached like what is the use of having goals yeah. and so but when we're acting, we're acting because it, it, there's a lower desire and a higher desire. So the lower desire is, I want to feel good. I want to build up my ego. I want to be safe. I want to impress others. I want to fit in with the world. Uh, you know, I want to have comfortable things. Um, and then the higher desire is, I want to, the true self wants to express itself through me in this physical world. And that is the higher desire. So it, the expression itself is the action. The result is just extra <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's really what it is it's like i'm because i'm compelled to uh, draw i need to draw and i need to paint i'm compelled to be a coach i need to coach i need to share or teach the attachment is are people do people like what i teach are people giving me the thumbs up on <laughs> on youtube and saying a great topic or are they saying you don't know what you're talking about that's the karma that's that and if you have that attachment it's not a pure action because you're doing it for the build up your ego. You're not doing it for the divine expression. And when you do it for the divine expression, that's when all the magic happens. It feels like a lot of people think if I let go of the attachment, I'm not gonna be able to enjoy the result. You'll actually enjoy it more 
because you're 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 free of the fear of it not turning out the way you want. You're it's just mm -hmm. like an artist who um, draws a painting not to sell it. Uh, you'll notice a lot of people they uh, you know draw art or they create music, and it's just for the the creative part of it. But when they're doing it to make money, everything kind of limits them, and they, they, their creativity shuts down, and they're kind of creating something to sell, and it feels different. It just the the product itself is <laughs> gonna feel because you're attached to people liking it, and you're using it to get money versus doing it out of your heart. Yes. And uh, and so, what does all this have to do with the divine path mm -hmm. of karma yoga? Mm -hmm. um, really, the the way Krishna explains it is that um, when you let go of that attachment to objects, which also entails letting go of the attachment to our ego or our, our ourselves our, our objects <laughs> yeah yeah the, this the, body our over identification with the body with the individual body that uh, and mind that we inhabit when we start to let go of that there is nothing for the uh the results of the those actions meaning the karma to bind to mm. if there is no you like in the in the ego sense then there's nothing that binds you essentially mm. What it does, it leads you to the realization that you are completely free, mm. that you are the pure awareness that creates the universe, and therefore you are not bound by karma. Now, I want to say this because I hear people thinking, how is this even possible? And we're not saying you do this in like a weekend, <laughs> like I'm going to be non-attached. Why not? This is a process. <laughs> Your ego is always going to try to attach itself to things mm. it's it, it, it's such a big part as long as we have a body we're going to be dealing with this ego so over time you you just practice non-attachment over time it gets easier it's just like anything else uh, your mind is an instrument we it's playing one tune <laughs> it's that reaction uh pleasure pain reaction you're kind of bringing in this other place for you to be and experience this body but not be attached to it. And it, it takes practice. So don't think that, thank God I listened to Deb's and Rob's uh, soul session and I'm going to be free of attachment now. It's a practice. So don't be hard on yourself when you get pulled in, when you get, but it's like, ooh, that the re, uh, here's a really good um, tip for you. Anytime you're unhappy and suffering is when you're attached. So ding, 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 <laughs> I don't feel well, I must be attached to something. You can always just say, what am I attached to? Mm. What am I attached to? And it, you, every time we're feeling that discomfort and, and fear or sadness, we could say, I'm attached to something. That's why I'm sad. It's not the event itself. It's I'm attached to something about this event. And then we're free. What we tend to do is we want to rearrange the furniture of that world and get everyone to play a different, I'd be better if this person would treat me nicer. And we're kind of like, putting the power outside of us. But I love this work because you can really feel empowered to have your own experience of life that's independent of the apparent reality. You're not this, you know, tied to this, these objects yeah. anymore, like hooked into them. And so you want to unhook yourself from those. And we can experience pleasure. We can experience those things. It's, it's an integration of human life and spiritual life. It's not to negate that suffering, but we'll realize we suffer less when we realize who we really are. We, we don't have yeah. the same edge or powerlessness and, and, and uh, um, ache that we have if we didn't do this work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a discipline, like you say, because the yoga um, requires that we wake up our our inner mind in mm. a sense our our true consciousness and that requires discipline so krishna explains it this way he says we're we're distracted by all these myriad objects in the world right we're chasing these uh, shiny objects all the time something new something novel some novelty uh, he says you have to make your mind one pointed in other words you have to focus on this because if you understand it's uh, let's say it's ultimate conclusion that it's going to free you from suffering and, and you're going to be able to act in the world 
not out of uh, ignorance, not out of egoism, but out of a higher purpose, right? To fulfill something much higher. Then you understand the importance of it and you make it your central goal in life. You wake up in the morning, you say, what am I doing? I'm working on my karma yoga, meaning I'm focused on f- liberating my I, mind from suffering, that's, from suffering that's your through goal. this action that mm-hmm. I'm taking. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's not that you have to go to Tibet, it's not that you have to go to the Himalayas or anywhere. Or Los Angeles to a retreat with Debbie and Rob, <laughs> but you could. <laughs> that the, the very actions you're taking today in this moment can liberate you mm-hmm. if you apply them in this karmic yogic way. So every time we take an action and not be attached, we uh, we have a chance to free ourselves. So yeah. here's what a lot of people will say to, in just kind of thinking of the question is, well, how can I be, it's hard for me to be non-attached in the moment. I usually forget uh, because we're taking action. We can set an intention, but we, we, we act all the time. So the second level the 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 catch second catch is how we respond to the result so when we say non-attached through action that's really like the height the like the the master level but we could start with what what is our response to a result and we work through that that um that emotion that trigger of that didn't work out the way i wanted to or watch ourselves get over excited about something and watch our attachment to things when they're good and you'll notice that there is a kind of a little voice in your head going, don't get too excited. <laughs> the, this is going to fall apart tomorrow. And you're just paying yeah. attention to how your mind is getting hooked in to the good and the bad, the pleasant and the unpleasant. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't mean that we have to ne- get rid of it. It's we have to watch it and understand its nature. So it's not like, no, I can't be too attached. And no, I can't feel suffering. I'm doing it wrong. It's Oh, that's interesting that my mind is really attached. Like I always uh, am conscious of how attached I am to you. And I'm like, oh, that's so interesting how I'm so attached to Rob. Like my ego is so attached to Rob. But being aware of that helps me less attached. You know, like it helps me m- understand its nature so I can enjoy being with you and having a relationship. But also be aware that, oh, yeah, I am a little attached here. And I know it's going to end up being the cause of my suffering one day. Um you know, when one of us decides not to be here, <laughs> I mean, that's going to be the end. But those things happen in life. And yeah. so it's like working with what our current um, response is to the results that we don't like and being able to unhook ourselves there. And then sooner or later, we can, it's, it's going to happen sooner in the process. Yeah. And, and a lot of people also ask for practical advice like they say okay this is a, that the metaphysical or kind of spiritual understanding is great but what do i do like give me something i can do and so here here it is here's something practical that you can do if you think about how you live your life you know the goals that you have in your life instead of just thinking from that perspective of i I want, I want to be successful. I want to have love. I want to have a house and a car or whatever it is. Think in terms of how can I give to people? How can I serve people? How can I uh, use my actions and my talents in this world to help people, to ease their suffering a little Mm. bit, to give them a little bit of knowledge, to give them a little bit of hope, anything like that. What you're doing is you're, you're dissolving the ego right there. Yeah. There is no sense of I in that action. And you feel whole, like you're overflowing. And so you're, there's no like lack when you're taking the action, which the ego feels very much in lack. Like it's always looking for more more stuff. Yes. <laughs> Where when you're giving, it's that kind of, and I'm not saying um, just give your stuff away and be selfless and that kind of um, not have any kind of uh, boundaries. <laughs> But more that idea of how can I express how who I am is wonderful. What can I share? How can I share who I am more with the world? Absolutely, that selfless action, mm-hmm. right, uh, is very powerful. It's a very powerful technique. It's not only been used in karma yoga, of course, in a lot of Christian traditions. It's also part of that that you think of others before you think of yourself, uh, and. If you do it in a spiritual sense with this 
deeper understanding that it's not just you trying to help others and trying to be a good person so that that you reflects can, well on you. Yeah, building up the persona. Right. Yeah. Then it becomes a spiritual practice mm. of, of this burning up past karma. And you, yeah, you, like, you burn it up because what, the actions that you're taking are liberating you mm. from that sense of I, from that conditioning of I. Yeah, it's funny. I see some people post on, um, there was one post on LinkedIn years ago where a guy was like, look, I." Uh, he took a picture of how he gave someone their gas and filled up their gas for them and this person didn't have any money and I'm such a good person and I did this good deed. And uh, all the comments were like, why did you feel like you had to share that? Like, can't you just do a good deed without like mm. getting that glory around it? And so you, you watch people, and I guess there is something of you want to show that it's good to give, you know? Yeah, it's better than Yeah, it's better not. than not. But then there, it's still that little hook. It's still like, <laughs> pat me on the back, feed my ego a little bit, because I'm a good person. And so yeah. we have to watch that we are we don't need to do that good deed to prove that we're a good person or to prove anything we're doing it out of our heart and when we do we don't need to tell everyone about it you know and, and a lot of it again because it goes back to the that idea of a conscious universe a lot of it is intention it's not actually in what you in do. the action yeah. but it's intending that when you think of a person when you interact with someone you intend that they be happy that they find their way instead of thinking Oh, uh, this this person is in competition with me, or or trying to trigger me, or, or something like that, right? We're simply intending that everyone find their way, that everyone uh, it has it easier in life. Mm. Even the people that um, that have hurt us, or we perceived have hurt us, I always say, like, have an intention for them. That they're becoming that they because they acted out of ignorance so you have the intention not like because what we want to do is we want to punish them for hurting us but if you have the intention of them becoming aware finding their path finding the answers you know coming to terms with you know their own stuff and why they would do something bad to you then that is beautiful because then you're just kind of you're letting it go you acknowledge you know they did something wrong but you're like saying they did it out of ignorance and you wish them to not be in ignorance so they don't hurt other people i mean if you wish harm on someone who's harmed you that's only going to create more harm in the world <laughs> because now they're if you wish harm on them they're going to get hurt again and who knows what they would do but if you hold that vision of them becoming and being aware everything can shift it could change the world and so that's really the um the practice of karma yoga is that in, it's an internal, even though we're acting, it's internal. Another thing I want to say, too, is that um, a lot of people ask about enlightenment and they mm. read a lot of books and they do a lot of listen to these calls. But when you say action, it reminded me that we can hear these theories and we can talk about non-attachment and you can learn about it and understand it intellectually. But you really don't know until you had a direct experience of it. And the action gives us that direct experience of interacting with the with the psychic phenomenon that we're dealing with and be, being able to free ourselves. That's going to be the greatest teacher for us. We have to learn it intellectually so we can know what we're doing. But the real learning is you going out there and, and integrating this into your life and integrating that non-attachment, like you said. Absolutely. Yeah, and so these traditions uh, that come from the Upanishads, uh, from the Gita, um, Karma Yoga, we're gonna also gonna be talking about Yana Yoga. Um, the Bhakti, path of knowledge. Bhakti Yoga, which is the devotional uh, path of love. And, and um, Raja. Raja Yoga, which is the path of, introspection with meaning meditation visualization um, all those uh, of course if we combine them let's say if we if we find elements uh, of these practices useful to us in our modern way of living they're going to help us free our mind and become better human beings uh, be able to create uh, conscious businesses uh, be able to uh, create projects that help uh, huma humanity in general, uh, but uh, also to kind of put our minds to solving these big 
problems that are uh, we're facing as as a species um, climate change pollution um, it's all born out of ego attachment that's right, right? the commercialism and that's it you know getting the bigger bigger better house than your neighbor and the n- new car that has you know an SUV where you're driving in a flat area you don't need an SUV for that you know like uh, being more conscious of, of the world and the connection we have I think man has lost a lot of the connection to the natural world and animals yeah. and what we're doing and we want to yeah, Make and sure just taking care of each other, yeah, and, uh, and kind of taking care of the planet. All those things then are tied to our individual awareness of ourselves mm-hmm. and how we perceive our actions and our actions in the world. And, and so these ideas, they're philosophical ideas that have been around for thousands of years, and they've been around for thousands of years because for of a reason. A, yeah, <laughs> for a good reason is that they actually work. Mm-hmm. But like you say, we have to be able to apply them. They, they're they no good if, if we're reading them as beautiful philosophy. And then post making a meme out of it and posting it on Facebook <laughs> and saying, non-attachment is the key to freedom, but not practicing it. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it is. And um, yeah, that, I think uh, setting the intention, I think also is very powerful because we train coaches and a lot of times we say that your intention for that client is actually will dictate really how successful they'll be in that coaching relationship so you seeing them as becoming you seeing that person as growing and changing that's so powerful it's transmission of knowledge to a, a, a client to to have someone that believes in you and that can see you uh, your possibility more than you can and, and opening that door. And um, and for ourselves, it's that true self can see us doing su- such great things. Uh, but our ego's like, yeah, I don't know. There's, you know, when I was seven, I pulled, you know, Susie's hair and, you know, I teased her a lot and I deserve to have this bad karma <laughs> because of that. No, we're free. And that, that really is, we've always been free. Uh, just like in uh, Wizard of Oz, just tap your heels, you're ready home. Uh, you always had the power within you and um, and that's what karma yoga helps us realize is like wait a minute I don't need to be attached and we start getting out of that mind that keeps us stuck so um, I am ready to uh, go to the next class next week hope you're having a great summer and um, we hope to see you soon don't forget to subscribe if you push the button on the bottom of this video on YouTube and and make sure you get announced when we're going live every week and uh, make a comment. Please share how you feel. Ask us questions. We're, we're in this, um, this, uh, this, we have a, our team interacting too that can help answer your questions as well. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Yes. Join program. our Facebook uh, group if you can. Uh, are there any questions there? Yes. How can I practice non-attachment when I'm trying to use my creativity to build a coaching business where I do workshops for kids. Yeah. Yeah, so non-attachment, remember, it doesn't mean that we're, we're not caring. Uh, on the contrary, it means we care enough to really consider how am I taking this action? What is the best possible way I can perform this action? which is creating the, this experience uh, for, your, for kids that you're doing. The, what, you, what you're working with in non-attachment is you're letting go of the attachment to a particular result. So you have your, your target in mind as the action. You know the actions that you need to take in order to create that event. All you're saying is, whatever results I I obtain from taking this action or creating this event I will be okay with it mm-hmm. in other so words when you're you not take a t- action to building your business and you say I want to make ten thousand dollars this month I want to sell this workshop you're doing it because you want to share your knowledge you don't say I'm good when I make X amount of sales or people like me now because and they and I have good stuff and people are acknowledging that that's attachment your ego is attached to mm. the result. And then what happens is, is you get the opposite all the time. You get the opposite. If there's fear around you not being able to create, 
because what you're doing is you're saying I'm an object as a coach and these other coach, uh, these students are objects and they're, they're these separate from me and I don't have any control over that. With non-attachment, you're actually creating from a place of oneness, those students are already there and you're just going and reaching out and taking them. Now, obviously this isn't something you can do immediately. Uh, it takes practice. It, it, this is an evolution. This isn't just a quick trick, mind trick that you can do and, and I'm gonna do this and I'm done. You have to ask yourself, what am I? what is my response to my current results? What's the emotions that I'm working with? Why am I cooked in? Why do I doubt myself? You have to ask yourself those questions because that's gonna tell you why you're so attached. And that's going to be pur purifying that. Yeah, and I love this part of the question. She says, when you are building a business, aren't we focused on outcome in a way? Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't mean you can't think through the action and, th and consider what would happen if I do this, right? What is going to happen when I put on this event or, or do this promotion? You can think through it. Right, and, and use your intellect uh, to kind of predict what is going, going to happen. But if you ask yourself, do I really need to be attached to the result? Mm -hmm. Meaning, do I need to feel terrible if it doesn't play out that way? Or do I need to be completely enthralled and happy if it does? That's freedom. Because if you're, if you're like t uh, white knuckling it going, I better get 10 people in this workshop yes. because I got to pay my bills. Guess what you're going to get? You're going to get the karma, the fear that you're putting into it of I'm not going to get it. And that's what's going to show up. So the, what the results are going to show you where your mind is. That's some of the things we teach in our coach training is the, yeah. the deepest driving desire. We're getting to the what, the results are always showing you where your mind is. So if you're getting an, a, a result and you're triggered by it and you're in fear, that's because you've been putting the fear into it. And it's not conscious until you get the result. So when you look at your result, you look at your response to it and your level of attachment to it. And then you have to ask yourself, why is this making me so upset? You have to go to the deeper, and it's not just I need to pay my bills and I need to be successful and all that. There's something deeper that you have to examine of why you're so hooked into it. And that's what's gonna free you. Yeah, so you focus on performing the action just the way you always do, right? All you're doing is dropping the attachment. Yeah. The, the I, the ego is extra in that whole process and because if you, wanna, you, okay. you can you can certainly act and perform those actions without the attachment to the results so attachment means you can it seems counterintuitive but the but the less attached you are the more money you'll make <laughs> so you have the goal but you're if you're not attached it will flow but if you're attached, you'll see lack. So we think if we try really hard and work really hard, we're gonna get a better result. That, that's kind of the Western way of approaching creating. And then there's also the law of attraction stuff where people are like, focus really hard and do your vision board. And, and it's all, it, it feeds attachment, the, the law of attraction. Cause it, it, it says that there's something out there that I'm attracting in. When we're actually experiencing is ourselves, and so the less attached you are, the more abundance you can have because your true self is abundant. So if you're trying to create from ego, you're going to get lack. You're going to get mixed results. You're going to be riding high when things are well. And if you have a low month, it, you're going to be in fear and you're going to be riding this roller coaster. But if you uh, become your true, become aware of that true self that's not attached, you're able to really reach a lot of people. You're, you're going to able to enjoy the process and it's not going to feel so stressful. <laughs> I promise you. I've done it both ways. And non-attachment is definitely a more pleasant way to be. Yeah. Great yeah. questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And it, we do have a course on that, too. If you're wanting to go deeper into success, we have a workshop on that whole process of attachment and success and working with it because we train coaches. So you might be interested in that one. Um, just go to our customer service and uh, they'll let you know where to find it. So yeah, awesome. it's a, it'll be the key to key to everything. Just practicing that more than any marketing you do or quick strategy, is is working with that non attachment is going to be the key for you, in anything you want to create. Yeah. So yes. see you uh, next week. Yes. Great uh, question. Next week we're going to be talking about uh, Yana Yoga, which is the wisdom or, or knowledge yoga.
<laughs> we hope you join us. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for all your comments. I didn't get to say hello to everyone, but thank you. We appreciate you here, and especially um, uh, Megan, who said she is glad she found the right program to join. She really enjoyed our topic, so thank you. Take stay, care. Stay well. Bye-bye.